first let's get started with a prayer in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost amen hail mary full of grace the lord is with thee blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb jesus holy, holy mary mother of god pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen Actionus nostros quesimus domini speranda proveni, et uvando prosegue contra nostro operatio te sempre incipia, percepta finiatur per Christum dominum nostrum. Amen. Immaculate heart of Mary, pray for us, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, um, I've realized in trying to put this, first I've been gone all week long, and I just got back yesterday, uh, so I am quite tired, but so hopefully my brain will work in giving you this conference because it does mean a lot to me, this conference does. But I did realize when I was trying to prepare for it that uh, you, you need, you know, we need 10 conferences to be able to get through all the information. But there's some essentials that I think that you all know. Every I know that everybody knows these things. But sometimes I think you just get lost being out there in the world and you start getting sucked into the natural versus trying to supernaturalize your um, your vocation. And I don't use the word vocation because I don't, when we, theologically, when we use the word vocation, we mean a supernatural vocation, which means religious life or the, or the priesthood. We don't mean it for marriage. Uh, when, when we use the word vocation for marriage, we mean the duty of supernaturalizing a natural a natural thing because we're all called to marriage i get young men and they come here and i talk to young women about their vocations and oftentimes we you get this this kind of confused discernment where they say but you know i'm glad i came and visited but i feel called to marriage and i say so do i and i will until i die because man is made to get married it's in scripture uh, but it's because God made them male and he made them female and he called them man. That means complementarity. A man is complete with a woman. A woman is complete with a man. That's humanity, a man and a woman. So we're, we're naturally drawn uh, to the opposite sex for the purpose of uh, that complementarity. A vocation, a true vocation is somebody who's called to something that's above that. They, they're able to see the good in that and, and, and leave that good behind for something better. So when I use the word vocation, uh, which I'm, hopefully I'm not going to use it again, but I, I used it. So in, in using the word vocation for marriage, we mean supernaturalizing something that's already of a natural function. Christ, and it's, some will say, well, Friar, it's a sacrament and, and religious life's not a sacrament. Yeah, I know. Religious life's a complete donation of self to God, whereas marriage is a donation of self to another. And Christ, Christ showed that through two baptized persons, that becomes a sacrament. That is a mystery in itself. That He grants special graces because you have two members of the body of Christ becoming one body in Christ. And so, what we want to talk about today is more along the lines of what the duties are. Um, for this just check there's already a, a chat thing let me just see can't hear you, you you're going to want to check for, for people that can't hear us you're going to want to check your own computer uh, you need to first see if your volume's up and you also need to check and see if um your your microphone or the the, the speakers are on so that's the first thing to check because no one else has written anything i'm presuming that i'm i'm being heard um so check your check your own screen. Maybe I can. You can't hear me if you can't hear me. So maybe I can write it in there. Sorry, I don't know how to write in here. So here. Check your uh, speakers and volume, volume, volume. Oh man. There we go. Uh, looks like we spelled volume wrong. So. So. Here I want to start. It's it's actually I've got I've got a lot of notes, and so that people don't want to cut my head off because of uh, saying things that are true about marriage, I'm going to use a lot of um, quotes, beautiful quotes, and I wish I could use all the quotes that I found, uh, but th that we would be here for a couple of days. So first, I want to preface things by by understanding 
marriage has been under attack and you all know it and women have been under attack even more so that the idea has been to destroy women it's been this way for a while we even have documents from the masons talking about how they have to destroy women if they want to destroy the culture what do you do you destroy women how they destroy women they stripped them of femininity right made the, they, they had this equality wars it's what they always do they do it nowadays in the with the socialists and the communists all this kind of stuff it's always pitting people against each other until they pit man against woman now they've disrupted the order and so many women in america actually believe that the disruption of order is actually right because men shouldn't be suppressing women and all this other kind of stuff that's true but order in its proper sense needs to be obeyed because we obey god in keeping that order so when we look to marriage you see that order and we'll get to it i don't want to jump ahead but what I do want to do is first I want to look at the marriage contract because there is a marriage contract. I'm sorry, they gave me some coffee, so I'm taking some sips. It's not bourbon. I'm not having cigars like they do on these Catholic things. I'm just trying to stay awake. So the quote, it's very important. And I think what really happens in marriage oftentimes is this fight that happens between the man and the woman. Now, I've seen so many beautiful marriages where that's not the case. The, the, the struggle is probably internally, there's always a difficulty of two different individuals that are in marriage that have to fight against their own, you know, sinful fallen nature, their own habitual selfishness and whatever else. We all have this. And in marriage, it's only amplified because it's such an intimate relationship between two fallen individuals who are trying to, to do their best. And so you, 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 you're going to you're going to you're going to you're just going to experience it a lot more. However, if there isn't a proper understanding of what your duty is before God, there you go. Now you've got a war on your hands. And this is what we have in so many marriages, especially uh, in these developed countries, as they would say, where there's a lot of feminism. Feminism has destroyed many women. And what it does, what feminism does to the feminine is it, it makes it a monster. And that's why it's difficult to deal with in marriage. Um, now, it's not just a one-sided thing. You're going to hear a lot about the women today, but that's just because when you even read and when you read about it, it, it actually comes from Genesis from the very beginning, why it's going to be more weighted on the women. But that doesn't take away from the duty of the man. It doesn't take away from the grave responsibility of the man. However, because you're dealing with a man as the head of the authority in the chain or in the society that's that's brought together through the bond between the man and the woman you have less to say about it because he's going to answer directly to god but a subject which the woman is and people don't like to hear it because subject oh oh my goodness that you can't say that there's equality there is equality and we'll get into it but we know that when there's a hierarchy someone's a subject i friar anthony am a subject to a man my friars are subject to a man. We, 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 we are subject in that way. We're obedient to them in that way, right? It's, it's a normal thing. Our Lord made himself subject and obedient unto St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin, and then even unto Pilate. Do you see? So this kind of stuff is just part of society. And I get, I'll get to that too. But in having that, that societal structure, the one who's at the head of that structure they have to answer directly to God for it. They need directions on what to do, but it's the subjects that need to know actually what their responsibilities are so they can fulfill their duties as a subject. So there's always more written on the subject than there is on the head. And it's like that with anything, because I know from, from, from training the friars in religious life, I've got pages and pages and pages and books that I can talk to them about their responsibility for obedience, their duties as, as, as friars. But when it comes to the superior, there might be a chapter or a paragraph that talks about what the superior has to do. Do you see? So it's not, you, you, if, if, if any of you are starting to have these ideas that, oh, here we go, it's just Friar Anthony's going to start slamming the women, beating up on the women. That's not what it is. The, the women, they serve a particular a role within, within the marriage, within that societal structure. And it happens to be that they're, they're, uh, they're under subjection in a, in a good sense, not in the sense that all this feminism and all this other nonsense says like it, 
Let's get into it because the quotes will be a lot better to help you understand exactly what we're talking about. When we look at Genesis 3.17, to the woman also he said, now this is after the punishment, remember, because they fall. And we're going to get into a little bit later uh, with some commentary from St. Uh, Lawrence of Brindisi, who does a wonderful commentary. He's a, he's a doctor of the church and uh, an under um, uh, a little known and, and under uh, valued doctor of the church. His theology is incredible, a uh, very scotistic, but so it's very, he's a Franciscan. But he's going to give us a little bit of commentary here later. But if we read this from, this shows us right away kind of where we, uh, kind of our, our, our point of departure and some of the difficulties that we find in, in everyday marriage. To the woman also he said, I will multiply thy sorrows, and thy conception in sorrow uh, thou shalt bring forth children. Everybody understands that, they accept it, childbirth is hard. And thou shalt be under thy husband's power, and he shall have dominion over thee. Before that, it wasn't that way. There was a, there was a perfect harmony. There would have been a perfect harmony before the fall. But when we look at the fall, now you're dealing with something else that happened. And again, we'll, we'll look to St. Uh, Lawrence here in a minute about what happens there at that moment. And to Adam, he says, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hath eaten the, of the tree, wherefore I commanded thee that thou should not eat. And then he gives the curses. Cursed be the land, cursed be all the things that he's going to have to do. Now, that work that he talks about isn't necessarily for today because Noah later on says it's a joy to work. And then it later says that uh, our Lord says he'll never curse the land again. So that was a curse that went just down on Adam, but it still uh, affects us in, in many ways. We will come back to these quotes. But first, we need to look at what a marriage contract is. What people don't realize nowadays in America, especially, they just think marriage is just this nice thing they do because they like each other or whatever else. And so they want to be, no, it's a contract. It's a fully binding, indissoluble contract. In that contract, it is a total donation of self one to the other. And that's not just in the physical. They tend to think about that in the physical, especially in the beginning, but that's not what it is. It's a, it's a total donation according to the the uh according to the way god has established that society with that bond between the man and the woman you have a society you have the 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 nucleus of a society that then there is 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 established in a indissoluble way so to to bring forth children which there you go now you have a, a, a society that's growing right through that bond of love well because you have a society and I think I have a quote in here. Uh, not yet. I don't have a quote yet in here. Because you have a bond in society, you have to have a hierarchy in society. Or you have anarchy. Do you see? I want to read to you a bit of this commentary. from. Uh, there's a few things I'm going to read because they're just so beautifully put. From this In this book, you can get it from the Colby Center. It's the writings of St. Lawrence of Brindisi on creation, commentary on creation and the fall. Just the verses, a verse by verse commentary, Genesis chapter one through three. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful book. It's a beautiful, I mean, excellent theology, absolutely. So on page 185, here we go. I'm going to read you this. At first, the woman was given to man as a solace and delight, as a companion and helper like himself, free from servitude. Now, however, she is set under her husband's power so that the man rules over her and reduces her to his power. These are hard things to hear when feminism has completely invaded and corrupted our society. Humility doesn't have a hard time hearing these things, but feminism destroys humility. So try to hear these with a humble heart. This is coming from a doctor of the church. Not Friar Anthony. Don't hate Friar Anthony. I'm just reading you a commentary from St. Lawrence of Brindisi, who did not hate women. Um, he, was a, he was a very special and beautiful soul. 
Now, however, she is set under her husband's power so that the man rules over her and reduces her to his power. And since one who is subject to the rule of another ought to follow his master's orders, keep his commands, and behave according to his will, not that he should do whatever, whatever the master wishes, but that he put into practice what his master desires by ascertaining his will. That means the, the husband doesn't just go around bossing. The, 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 the wife is not a slave. Absolutely in no regard is she a slave. But he is to put into practice. He, he's to put into practice or command the way in which his master, our dear blessed Lord, would command. And so you can imagine the duty of the husband <clears throat> being able to, having the duty to command so beautifully and so, so lovingly. But still it's a duty. So he should practice what his master desires by ascertaining his will <clears throat> assenting him and con, uh, conforming to his will. So he, uh, uh, the husband needs to conform to the will of God, to the will of uh, our, our dear blessed Lord. And to your husband shall be your desires, so that you may not do the things you wished nor desired, but that you refer your wishes and desires to your husband, and do not what he and, and do what he wishes, comply with his wishes, and obey him. The reason for your submission, he says, is that he shall have dominion over you. He's giving us commentary. The reason for your submission is that he shall have dominion over thee. That is to say, I set him as Lord over you. And I will and, and I will you acknowledge his dominion over you. He's speaking for God. I will you acknowledge his dominion over you and that you always regard your husband as giving you as giving you as your master. This is all part of the contract. He will rule, govern, rebuke, correct, reprove and reproach you when necessary, lest living heedlessly and freely outside his control, you come to your downfall. Now, is this all about some, uh, you know, just some man dominating over some woman and how this isn't equality and all this other kind of stuff? It doesn't have anything to do with that. In religious life, we, we willingly put ourselves under somebody's obedience. In marriage, you pick that person. In, 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 in religious life, you don't pick that person. You pick that form of life and you pick God, which is the same thing it's supposed to be in marriage, and you enter into that. But in that same way, he's there to rule me, govern me, rebuke me, correct me, reprove me, reproach me when necessary, lest me living heedlessly and freely outside of his control, I come to my downfall. See the beauty of that? The woman gets that. She gets somebody who can be vigilant. Now, is the husband always vigilant? That's not the point. The point from the woman's perspective is that she's, she has a duty in that regard. The man has the duty in the regard he has to do this. And I'll tell you, it's always harder to lead and do these kind of things because most people don't like to do this kind of stuff because this all has to be actually done with charity, not just going around beating up people and bossing people around according to your own will. That's not what's intended here in the least bit. The meaning could be as follows, he says, and your desire should be to your husband from a natural desire by which the woman desires her husband for the, for the sustenance, defense, protection, companionship, security, and delight, all of which the woman is, as it were, lacking. This is just as something imperfect always is accustomed to the desire, the perfect but which it can be perfected and 
and its defects uh, are about to be satisfied. Okay. St. Lawrence of Brindisi. And I want to read this other, I want to read this to you, which sums up, it's really a summation of everything we're going to go over. And this is from a beautiful book, The Apologetics. Unfortunately, they did redo this, and so there's some modern stuff in it that I, I think is kind of confusing. But the, I can't find the older document, but it's still, it's a good book for the, uh, the, the greater part of it. It's an apologetical book. But it has a wonderful little write-up here that goes into the scripture quotes and gives good balance, I think, for the husband and the wife. The duties of the husband and wife to one another, the primary duties of husband and wife to one another, bind under pain of mortal sin. They must help one another to lead good Christian lives and support one another in the necessities and duties of life. Support one another in the necessities and duties of life. They should share any riches with each other and, if necessary, be willing to share any poverty with each other. The marriage vows express this mutual support, sharing, and fidelity. I take you to have and to hold for this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part, in everything. Men and women are equal in personal dignity. This is forgotten sometimes. It's sometimes heard that when, when you hear these difficult words, the women hear the difficult words, or men hear the words that the women have to be submissive, well, it's not a word you really just start throwing around with ladies saying you got to be submissive. You got to be submissive. That's not really what it means. It, what, 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 we'll get into it. But what for the men, you never, you never, you never hoard it or lord it over somebody else. Your authority over them, you help them. Our Lord helps us in in His authority over us. He makes it delightful to serve Him, and that's what a husband's called to do in the family. So even when he comes home in a nasty mood, it's for him to, de to completely deny himself and then walk in with a greater burden on his shoulders to be able to alleviate the wife, to be able to help the wife, to be able to sustain her. Because it's a mutual, there's a mutual, there's, there's a sister, a brother and a sister kind of relationship as well. There's an equality there. Because there's a person, there's an, e there's an, it's equal and personal dignity. But as husband and wives, and fathers and mothers are different and complementary in their roles or functions within the family. The husband, to the husband, God has entrusted the headship in marriage because it is a true society. And society has to have, um, it actually has to have an order or again you have anarchy. A wife should submit to her husband as the head of the household. What, what does that submitting mean? It's not just to the man, it's submitting to the order of God. And she's submitting to the head of the family as she submits to God. So rebellion against the head of the family is rebellion against God. Do you see, we don't, you don't, you're not being called just to serve a man, you're being called to serve God. You signed on for marriage and the way you serve God in marriage is to see the head of the family is the place that's what we do in religious life too they don't we don't serve the superior you're serving god all of our obedience is about serving god it's the same thing in marriage the wife should submit to her husband as the head of the household and the husband should love his wife as much as himself this also is often forgotten sometimes the the men want to think that submission 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 you need to obey 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 but there's there's a there's a role here for the man to now if the man abuses his role and it's not sinful what he's asking you to do and we'll get to that too the wife does good to obey and I'm going to show you there's uh, the book of uh, blessed Anna Marie Taiji wonderful a wonderful example for 
housewives and really for anybody. Uh, but but she was she was just a, so devoted to her um, to her her station in life um, and a, an incredible mystic. But her husband didn't always treat her all that well. Uh, but she didn't let that bother her because it didn't have to do. She wasn't serving her husband for her husband. She was serving her husband for God. So husbands should love their wives as much as themselves. The Holy Spirit says, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and his, his and is himself its Savior. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Even so, husbands, husbands should love their wives as their own body. For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes, nourishes it and cherishes it. Do you see that? He's to nourish and cherish his wife. Husbands, love your wives. And do not be harsh with them. It's from Ephesians 5.22. And Colossians 3.19. I think we're going to read these all later. A misunderstanding of the nature of authority leads some to contradict or ignore these texts of sacred scripture relating to spouses. To appreciate the apostolic teaching... We must realize that the hardship of a husband is not, I'm sorry, the headship of the husband is not that of a tyrant. Do you see that? Now, ladies, your husband is not being a tyrant just because he asks you to do something that's normal. Okay? Sometimes nowadays, if, 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 if a husband exerts his headship, he's immediately taken as a tyrant because he's not recognizing the woman as the head. So that has to be understood, and we have to make sure we're mortifying and doing things in proper order for the glory of God. Marriage for the glory of God. Each one of us, our role for the glory of God. But husbands are not to rule over. This is for the husband to think about, not the wife. It's not for the wife to start going saying, you're a tyrant. <laughs> and if she does say that to you, you really need to reflect on it and see, am I a tyrant? Because I think, you know, it, 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 we need to be, like we talked about last Saturday, we need to, be able to see the reflection in those who are closest to us. But the husband needs to really reflect on what it means to be Christ in the family. Because we don't want Christ to be harsh to us, nor do we want to show that harshness to uh, the ones under, under us. So for you all, that would be your spouses who you're supposed to cherish. So the headship of the husband is not that of a tyrant, but of one who devotes himself to the good of his wife and of their marriage and family in imitation of Christ. How in imitation of Christ? How he laid down his life for his spouse, the church. Husbands, as Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. See, Christ didn't. Christ never. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You can see that in marriage. If, if you love me, but see, there's a gentleness, there's a harmony in the interaction be, between Christ and us. We're getting ready to crucify him. He's just saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. In marriage, there has to be that harmony too, but there has to be the, the asking, the receiving, the giving, the taking. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Oftentimes, I talk to young men nowadays, and I think a lot of young men just don't know what it means to be a man. They, were never, they never learned how to do it. So the wife heroically wants to stay home, though she's quite capable and could get a wonderful job and bring in all kinds of money. She stays home. She stays home. She tries to she tries to take care of the family or try to raise a young family and has the greater dignity and duty 
of raising the children, which sometimes gets lost. They think that the rate here in America, we tend to think that making the money is the more important role, and it's not the more important role. <laughs> Forming children is, uh, is one of the greatest dignities and duties you can have. So the husband goes to work, and he has to actually provide the resources for the wife to be able to do the more important job. Do you see that? It's not so much that she's just home because he commands her to be home and uh, she has to, he, he, he works all the time and she needs to fulfill his will. Now that would be absolute perversion of the will of God in marriage. Right order is the man's been given greater strength and he's commanded to go out and work. The wife is, 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 is put under submission and is there to take care. She's the helper, right? So she's there to help with these kind of things. She raises the family. He provides. But when he goes, when he goes out, when he comes back in from that, a lot of times the younger men, they'll find it, they find it difficult having such a leadership role put on their shoulders. And so when they come back in, they're out there slaving away day in and day out. She's just at home doing nothing, which is a ridiculous thing to say. But sometimes you can think it when you're not there seeing what she does all day long. And so you can get these young men who basically out of the difficulty of um, their immaturity and not ever having received good formation as a, what it means to be a man, they actually start this kind of strife with the wife uh, because they don't know how to handle the stress of being a man in the world. They, they come home and they start that strife with the wife which is a great hardship on the wife. Um, and it, it and the man doesn't seem to understand. He just thinks that it's the wife's fault when really it, it tends to be that the man needs to learn how to take kind of a double dose on his shoulders. In religious life, someone who is to be formed, at least in the former religious life I come from, someone who's to be formed as a priest has to take the full burden of community life in the community, which is always very burdensome, all the prayers, all the all the meals, all the recreations, all the work, all the cleaning, all the all the other duties, then they also have to study for the priesthood. Then they also have to take on the duties and burdens of the priesthood. They don't get they, they get a double they get a double burden on their shoulders. And that's the way I think of it for it should be for the man. If he's been if he's been given by God the duty to lead the family, he has to be able to take on the double burden onto his shoulders. So when he comes home from work after being jaded all day and are feeling jaded from being you know, in, the, in the distracting whirlpool of the world, he's able to come home and still alleviate the burden of the wife, assist with the children, give her free time so she can go pray. These are the things that a, a man is supposed to do because if he wants that for his own flesh, he should want it for his good wife. But oftentimes this gets perverted because the young men don't have leader, they haven't seen this ever in their life. They don't know what to do with the anxiety of leadership. And so they take it out on the one person that they feel I can't leave them. And it tends to be their wife. A very unfortunate thing for the wives. The husband's headship is not the privilege of getting his own way, but the responsibility of leadership for the good of the couple. A double burden on his shoulders, or at least it should be. And that's why the wife should always try to help with the burden. Do you see? Do you see that? That's where you find the harmony. The man struggling and striving to provide for the family and alleviate the burden of the wife. The wife is struggling and striving to really take care of the family and assist the husband in all of his duties so that they have that they have that harmony that they give to each other. In other words, his authority is ordered towards service, like our Lord when he washed the feet of the disciples. He washed their feet to show he was serving them. The husband's to serve. If for whatever reason he cannot fulfill his responsibilities, the duties uh, dissolve or devolve to his wife, because somebody has to make up for the wife. The wife can't just sit there with her hands tied. And in fact, this is why oftentimes you see more virtue. Uh, you, God will grant certain graces to these wives where they just have great ability in some of these things. Managing the household. They talk about in Holy Scripture. I think it's in Wisdom. It might be in Proverbs. I always say Wisdom. I think it's in Proverbs. It talks about the diligent woman. I think it's in 
uh, chapter 31, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you, but the joy of a house is a is a is a is a is a is a woman with a man's heart. I think is what it talks about, meaning a heart of strength. Both are equally bound to each other in the duties of dwelling together, and the duty of uh, marital affection. Again, the Holy Spirit says, "Husbands, live considerately with your wives. Train the young women." To love their husbands. That comes from St. Peter, first, first Peter 3 7. The marriage vow demands absolute loyalty and affection and intimacy. Spouses are seriously bound to avoid anything that can endanger their mutual fidelity. Now, that doesn't just mean mutual fidelity in the physical, anything that would endanger their mutual fidelity in the, the role that they play within their little society for assisting each other, especially in the way to heaven. This is the main thing. We're not looking at this stuff from a natural standpoint. If you go through and you have all these, but what if, but what if, and all this nasty negative comments that start coming into your head because of the feminism that's tainted you, you have to realize you're thinking about this in a natural perspective. God does this and it's supernatural. He wants supernatural order. He wants to restore everything in their proper place. He's done this after the fall to assist each according to the fall. Men don't want to lead. Women do. You see it from what Eve did. You see it what, what, with what Adam did. Men have to lead. Women have to, they have to, um, uh, they have to assist in that. They have to be under subjection. This is all done for our sanctification. And God puts everything in proper order so we can grow in that. Now, there's actual graces that flow from the sacramental, from the sacrament that enables the discharge of these duties. It strengthens their mutual love and loyalty. These actual graces come, they're actually sac sacramental graces. They come from the sacrament of marriage. And that's why that, that, that sacrament is there. One of the reasons that sacrament is there is to provide for you all the graces you need to be able to do these difficult things. It strengthens their mutual love and loyalty. It fosters them in their spirit of patience and, and unselfishness. It gives them the constant help to lead holy lives. And, and this is really important, that you don't always see it. You see more of a, a strife happening between husband and wife more than a competition. There's, more, there's kind of a, um, but let me just say, to give good example one to another and thus save their souls, that is, each other. So there should be a holy competition of hoping the other outdo, outdoes you in the holy competition. You try to you try to live more zealously in the in the in the um, in your observance of the faith, and then you give them the good example. So then they'll do it, and then you take their good example, and then you surpass them. This is a holy rivalry. You want them to surpass you in it, and then you want to surpass them. It's the same thing we say in our consecration uh, to the Blessed Virgin. St. Maximilian Mary Colbe. Some scripture quotes that we know about, but I would tell you, or I would, I would uh, ask you, that especially you married people, because I know that there's some people that are, what, that are probably uh, signing on to part, you know, participate in the talk that aren't married. And it's a good thing. It's good to know about marriage, especially if people come to us and and then we know how to support married people too that that are having difficulty because sometimes when when married people being in that small society especially that the the wives if they do stay home and take care of the family sometimes they don't leave the house that often because they have so many duties at the house and in fact what 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 we learn is the one that has to leave the house all the time the man he should really even take care of the duties outside of the house so she doesn't have to worry about that. She has, she, she's able to keep that kind of sweetness for the family to help raise the children in that peace. That's not always possible, but when it is possible, um, it could be that when a dark cloud kind of settles over the house, um, I, I find that you'll, you might get it sometimes in the friary or something like that or wherever, but you got to get this dark cloud that settles in. It, it, it gets it gets difficult to see kind of the way forward. So helping people, especially the the women, not especially the women, but uh, well, the women who might be 
there in that house all the time to know about marriage is to be able to help them also when they get confused because that dark cloud confuses us you can know something very very well but when the dark cloud settles in confusion settle sets in and it's really hard to see so if you have if you have a good friend some of the for the single people and they're married or whatever and they're getting confused because of the difficulty they tend to be going through at home at that particular time then these kind of talks are good because you can understand the proper way to kind of help them see their duties and things like that when they might be suffering quite a bit at the moment so scripture quotes matthew 19 46 he answered them and he said have you not read he who made them man from the beginning or who he who made man from the beginning made them male and female see that when we say man all the time, we don't mean males. We need male and female. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave his, his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be, uh, be in one flesh, starting their own society. In um, St. Paul, I think this is St. Peter. Oh, goodness. I didn't write down this quote. It's from, it's from St. Paul, but I didn't write down the quote. I think it's probably... Um, anyways, my apologies. Being subject one to another in the fear of Christ. See that? The subject one to another. He's saying this, he's saying this to us as Christians. So can we not apply it in, in married life? No, that there is a subjection one to the other. But then he says, let women be subject to their husbands as to the Lord. Not just for the man. It's not about, it's not about men domineering and all this other kind of stuff. It's for the Lord. Because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of, of his body. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so also let the wife be to their husband in all things. But for Christ's sake, husbands, love your wives, as Christ also loved the church and delivered him up, himself up for it. Now we have to remember that husbands will, it doesn't, you know, there's there's some wives out there saying, well, well, he doesn't do this, and I say this to him, and I've researched, and he doesn't know, and he won't listen to me. Your husband is going to have to pay. He's going to have to make an account to Christ himself, not you. Our job, our job in obeying, our job in being subjects, is to be subject. That that's what we do in being subjects. We're just we're subject, and I'm I'm going to be accountable to me being a subject. My superior is going to be accountable. For being my superior so the husband's going to be accountable for being the the superior and the wife's going to be accountable for being the subject and these aren't bad terms these aren't bad terms whether you like them or you don't like them uh, they're, they're they're what they are the church the commentary in the in the dewey says the church is subject to christ that is the church then according to saint paul is ever obedient to christ and can never uh, fall from him, but remain faithful to him, unspotted and unchanged to the end of the world. St. Peter, there's a long quote from St. Peter, but St. Peter has a beautiful way of saying everything he says. St. Peter, it's 1 Peter 3, uh, 1 through 7. That he might sanctify it, talking about the the body of the church cleansing it by the lather of water uh in the in the word of life that he might present to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish here we can apply marriage to all of this without spot or wrinkle or any kind of blemish but it should be holy without blemish everything in right order so also ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 
For no man ever hateth his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, as also Christ, Christ hath uh, done to the church, because we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. In like manner also let wives be subject to their husbands, that if any believe not the word, they may be won by the word, uh, without, they may be won without the word by the conversation of the wives. That is, that humble docility, those women give very good example and they can win their husbands and others through that, just like Blessed Anna Marie Taiji. Let it not be the outward plating of hair and the wearing of gold and the putting on of apparel, but the hidden man of the heart, the incorruptibility of a quiet and meek spirit, which is rich in the sight of God. This is where you really true, you find the beauty of woman because you know, you, women, women that are very faithful that God has blessed with uh, marriages that he's blessed with lots of children. The women have to sacrifice a lot of their beauty because they, they continue to have babies and it's a very difficult thing to to maintain the glorious body that the world wants uh, everybody to have today, which just rots in a pit anyways afterwards. But what you find, you find in, in women that, that enter into their femininity, you find this kind of strong tower of virtue. And, and that's what St. Peter's talking about, not in all the external beauty but in the incorruptible and in incorruptible beauty of a quiet and meek spirit which is rich in the sight of god we think of the blessed virgin in this which i'll talk about at the very end for after this manner hitherto the holy women also who who trusted in god adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands as sarah obeyed abraham calling him Lord, whose daughter, whose daughters you are, doing well, uh, doing well and not fearing any disturbances. Now he turns to the husbands. You husbands, likewise, dwelling with them according to the knowledge, giving honor to the female, as to the weaker vessel, and as to co-heirs of the grace of life. Now that weaker vessel part, people in America, I can, I can imagine ladies in America getting mad about the weaker vessel thing, but you think about it. If you got stoneware, if you got stoneware plates and you got China, which one's more valuable? Your China is more valuable than your stoneware. Though if, if, I, if I hit my stoneware against the sink when I'm washing it, it might not break. If I hit the China, it's probably going to bust. So we treat our China with much greater um, honor, right? So this is where he's saying this kind of weaker vessel. For that reason, a husband treats the wife not as a punching bag or whatever else of coming home from work and taking it all out on her, but as the weaker vessel that deserves honor. And as the co-heir, the co-heir of the grace of life. See, there's a quality there. That your prayer be not hindered. And in fine, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, being lovers of the brotherhood, merciful, modest, humble, not rendering evil for evil, nor railings for railings. This is what you find in a lot of immature relationships that even if they've been married a while, it's the squabblings, petty squabblings. Instead of the, the hunting for virtue, the, the mortifying speech, the saying, yes, you're right. What's wrong with saying, yes, you're right. I'm gonna do that. Yes, I will do that. But con counterwise, blessing, for unto this are you called that you may inherit a blessing. This is the purpose of undertaking all the difficulties and hardships of your position within your marriage, whether you lead or you have to be subject 
taking on those duties because you are trying to inherit a blessing. And if you didn't, we have to ask the question, what are you doing? You get married. You have to get married for the service of God. Now, most of you didn't do that. You thought you were doing that, but you know you didn't do that. But now you just have to act that way. That's what you have to do. You have to live your marriage for the service of God. Ephesians 5.21 says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall be two in one flesh. This is a great sacrament. But I speak in Christ and in the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular love his wife as himself, and let the wife fear her husband. What do you mean fear? This fear thing, we always freak out about it in English. Fear is not to want to disappoint him, right? This is how we treat God. We don't want to disappoint God. We fear God, not because he's going to hit me with a lightning bolt. We fear God because he's good and I love him and I, and I want him to be pleased. This is what Blessed Anna Marie Taiji did. Her husband came home for work. I know I've given this example. I love this because it's absolutely contrary to the way everybody thinks today. The husband come home for work. He was a difficult man. She prepared the table. Everything was perfect. She knew her husband. She did everything just right. And then he got there, threw everything off the table onto the floor, sat down and said, serve me. And she would stand there right next to him, waiting to make sure he was content. When he threw everything onto the floor, she just sweetly went, picked it all up, and prepared something else and served him. Was it right what the husband did? Absolutely not. He'll be judged. Was it right what Blessed Anna Marie Taiji did? Absolutely. She became a saint. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely incredible. She just did one of these things. Okay. And just went and did her job. Because the husband throwing everything on the floor has nothing to do with her. Had nothing to do with her. It has to do with him. Do you see? But if she would have gotten involved in that and said, what are you doing? I've slaved away all day long. I tried to do all these things and you throw everything on the floor. I'm done with this. She wouldn't be blessed. She'd just be another lady that's thinking of herself and wanting to be respected and treated properly and whatever. And we don't, we, we will get our reward. We'll get our reward. But martyrs in heaven, the majority of them will have palm branches of patience, not of blood. One other thing I wanted to mention here, when you read this, the sacrament, this is a great sacrament, the marriage, it's a great sacrament. It is, like what I said before, you have a man who's baptized, you have a woman who's baptized, a member of the body of Christ, a member of the body of Christ, and then they become one flesh. That's a great sacrament, meaning that's a great mystery. All the more why Christian marriage should not just be held in great honor, needs to be lived very honorably. Colossians 3.18 says, All whatsoever you do in word or in work, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by himself. Wives, and he says, Wives, be subject to your husbands as it behooves in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter towards them. See that? It was a problem back then too. The husband's coming home from work and being all nasty because it's difficult being out in the world. And then they come home and they just want to be nasty. No, a man has to take on a double portion. And this is where wives, if you can keep that feminine sweetness, it really helps the husband who gets jaded out in the world. Husbands, when you see that feminine sweetness, you have to preserve it. That's that weaker vessel thing. You want to make sure that, that that beautiful china doesn't become hardened stoneware, right? Because it's that beautiful femininity that God gives to a woman. It's made to help tenderize a man's heart when he comes back home. So he doesn't let the world turn him into a monster. If you do these things, you'll have harmony. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter towards them. Colossians continues, it says, Whatsoever you do, do it from the heart, as to the Lord, and not to men. What's that mean? Don't, don't, lady, the women, women, don't be, don't be subject to your husband so your husband thinks you're subject to him. 
you're subject to your husband for the love of God. You obey your husband, not because, not for your husband, you obey your husband for the love of God. So if he thinks you're, you're obedient because you're, you're trying the best you can, well, you give honor to glory. You give your, you just give it back to God. Well, blessed be God. That's, that's wonderful. If you are obedient and you're not thought obedient, well, that also goes in the exact same place. Do you see? Whatsoever you do, do it from the heart as to the Lord and not to men. So men love and women obey from the heart for love of God. Knowing that you shall receive of the Lord the reward of inheritance. Serve ye the Lord Christ. For he that doth wrong shall receive for that which he hath done wrongly. So if one of you is doing this improperly, you're going to receive your payment, whether your husband or your wife um, brings it to your attention. In the end, spouses can only control their own actions and not the actions of their spouse. This is the big gamble with getting married because you don't know, you don't yep. know what's going to happen in a few years. The, the living through their life is going to Dr. affect Jamie. your spouse. You don't know what difficulties yeah. are going to fall into. What, for as many of you, as have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. When you have an abbess of a monastery, she's in charge. When we go and visit the monastery, we ask the abbess what we're supposed to do. She's in charge. She has the full authority to bless her subjects. But they all go to her, and she has the full authority to correct, to govern, to rebuke, all the things that, 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 uh, that the authority has to have under her. It's not just for men. It's for whoever has that authority. So we want to strive for marriage that's rightly ordered. And that's what it's become. It's become unrightly ordered so we can get along. A lot of times it's just to get along. A lot of times, in most cases, men have to relinquish uh, the authoritative rule, role that they have within the family so that there's peace. But our Lord said, if you love me, you will keep my command, my commandments. In that order that he's established, we want to keep it for love of him not for any other other reason because this is a great sacrament but i speak in christ and the church ephesians 5:32 so our thoughts on this husbands you will make an account for your wives and wives understand the weakness of your husbands that he will have to make an account for you I will get to the, let me go to the moral theology first, and then we will get to St. Lawrence of Brindisi. Actually, I think it's time for St. Lawrence of Brindisi. Hopefully we'll get back to the moral theology stuff. No, no, we'll jump, we'll do the moral theology stuff. Husbands, this comes from um, a moral theology book, Christ and His Sacraments by Dolan and Cunningham. That's an older one. It's a really good book. I don't think it's moral. I don't know what it is. It's a, I think it's sacramental theology book. The other one, uh, there's another one I have here on moral theology. Husbands must rule. The husband must rule his family without bossiness. Hear that? Without bossiness, <clears throat> but with good example, like Christ. Christ didn't go around bossing everybody around. With good example, friendly persuasion and counsel. Only rarely should it be necessary for him to use his full authority towards his wife, meaning he has a full authority because it, it, you, you, can't, you can't have an authority and have a subject and not have that authority, but it's not something you wield lightly. So it's for the men to wonder, do you wield that a little bit too much? Because it's not fair to do. You know the hardship on the woman for having to uh, already have the place she has 
in in God's plan because of especially the attack from the culture. So the husband has to having that love for his own flesh, his wife, has to really make sure he does not wield this authority lightly, only when necessary, which may never happen in a lifetime. But when authority is necessary, and he neglects his duty, he neglects his duty if he does not use it. Do you see that? That's something that has to be understood. He has full authority to use towards his wife, but it should only be used rarely if it, and only when it's necessary. But when authority is necessary, he neglects his duty if he does not use it. His duty also is to provide to the extent of his ability, the necessities of life according to the social status of the family. It's his duty to provide for the family as best he can. Wives, the wife must remember that next to God, she must love her husband above, above all others. Next to God, she must love her husband above all others and that she must be loyal to him in every way. The care of the household and training of the children in virtue is in a special way her providence, or I'm sorry, her province. God entrusts this to her in a special way. To desert these duties for, for work outside the home which is not absolutely necessary, however gainful it might be, or for social activities, manifestly childish, child, child, childishly uh, selfish failure to measure up to the nobility, dignity, and responsibility that is hers as a Christian wife and mother. Great dignity has been given to the woman in the, in the service of the family. Because it is a greater thing to form other humans for the love of God and prepare them for heaven than it is to make money. If they continue in another section saying many, I think it's in their conclusion, same group, Christ and his sacraments by Dolan and Cunningham. Many of America's divorce, many of America's divorce problems can be traced back to a false notion of obedience a false notion of obedience. The subjection that a wife owes to her husband does not consist in a kind of uh, material uh, marital slavery. It does not consist in a kind of marital slavery. She does not lose her liberty as a human person. Rather, she finds a new liberty a consummate dignity founded upon her role as wife, mother, and companion to her husband. However, the so-called social equality of the modern man and woman has had tragic repercussions on family life. Woman, in an attempt to free herself from the duties of marriage, has enslaved herself by the chains of immodesty, negligence, and personal sorrow. If women, if woman would recognize the importance of true obedience, obedience to the will of the divine plan, she would find peace of conscience in a confused world. If woman would recognize the importance of true obedience, obedience to the will of the divine plan, she would find peace of conscience in a confused world. That's a beautiful way to put it, because the obedience is to the divine plan. What's the cause of this disorder? I'm going to read you a quote from of the commentary from St. Lawrence of Brindisi, of course, in that green book I showed you, uh, the fall, it's um, on creation and the fall 
a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. It can be found at the Colby Center for Creation. Wonderful work that they put out there. This has to do with Adam's reaction to his wife. Lawrence of Brindisi says this, The commentary or the scripture is, and it was pleasing to the eye, that is the fruit. Or according to the Hebrew, desirable for understanding. This attribute is not a real, is not a real one, but is recorded as an opinion of the woman, who being deceived by the words of the serpent, made the judgment about the tree, and thus made herself think that her opinion reflected reality. Now this happens a lot nowadays, right? We, we often make our opinion reflect reality. That's what we have to very, very be, we have to be very careful that what we start to think about doesn't become the reality. That's also those, all those thoughts that come in. We can easily do that. So thus made herself think that her opinion reflected reality. Certainly from the pleasantness of the fruit and the lovely appearance of the tree, she persuaded herself that what the serpent said to her was true. The force of the inordinate desire was so strong that the woman estranged and seduced beyond all limit of reason created figments of her imagination and told herself things and believed them. She had asserted that she was not to touch the fruit of the tree, something that God had never commanded to her, not never commanded of her. Not to speak of touching it, she took it. That is to say, she plucked the fruit from the tree and ate it, violating God's command. And she induced her husband to eat. And she gave some to her husband after she had eaten of it. This is all still Lawrence of Brindisi. Indeed, she persuaded her husband and urged him and held it out for him to eat. He ate, not because he believed the words of the tempter and thought he, should, uh, that thought he had spoken the truth. And he was not deceived by the demon. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.14, it was the woman, not the man, who was deceived, owing to his great love. He was not able to resist the woman as she held out the fruit and persuaded him to eat of it and ate in order not to sadden her and let her go away from him without her wish being fulfilled. This is actually quite common in relationships. The man will know he has to lead. He'll know there's something he's supposed to do. So as not to sadden the wife or upset the wife or to maintain peace, he will relinquish his duties. And therefore he becomes culpable for not leading the family. He was not able to resist the woman as she held up the fruit and persuaded him to eat of it and ate it in order not to sadden her and let her go away from him without her a wish being fulfilled. Afterwards, Adam puts the blame on her and on God. First God, then the woman who gave him to eat is what he says. And Lawrence Brindis, he says, he certainly lacked every excuse since it was necessary for him to obey God, not the woman, and keep his command. He did not receive from her, he did not receive her from God as his overlord, but as a companion and a spouse, subject to her overlord, that is him. It's necessary to obey overlords, not companions and subordinates who one must above all command. If he allowed himself to be persuaded by her, since otherwise he could have and should have rebuked and reproved her, rather than listen to her, use his authority. He should have used his authority and 
original sin would have not have contaminated the entire human race. Without doubt, he never, he sh um, without doubt, he never should grieve the Holy Spirit in order not to cause grief of the woman. If now he accuses her as guilty as a guilty party, he should have reproached her beforehand. And when she erred, he should have censured her, meaning given her a punishment. Now indeed, he should have forbidden her to eat. He should not be, uh, she should not be dear to him that he would allow her to sin again against the Lord God in order not to make her sad. Moreover, he himself should not commit the same crime on account of her. Therefore, he was an accessory, much less, but not by not prohibiting it. But even much more gravely by following it. Wherefore, excusing himself from sin, he involves himself more in sins and adds sin to sin. Adam had a duty and he failed. And that failure in that duty, you see this played out in the relationship of men and women today. The woman wants to take over. She wants to usurp that role. The man wants to give it away. In the end, they're both going to be judged on it. True harmony will come when the man fulfills the role of headship as in Christ and the woman as the church with Christ. When that order comes back, when we're able to bring that into our families, what we have is harmony. The woman becomes sanctified because God loves to see that uh, violence that she does to herself in following his command. The man is sanctified in it because he has, a, does, has to do a violence in actually standing up and commanding when he doesn't even feel capable of doing it. But also more with the man to take on that extra burden of being able to strive for the, for the good counsel and good example of the family. That's, most of this authority is expressed through example more than word. The moral theologians say this, and it gets more into kind of the, it's the moral theology, but it's also dealing more with the scriptural quote of Christ as the head and the wife as the, as the, as the church and, and Christ's union with the church. It's from the Moral, Theolo uh, moral Theology, Volume 2, a complete course based on St. Thomas Aquinas and the best modern authors by uh, McHugh and Colin. Just a couple of quotes and we're almost done. Please bear with me. I know it's unbearable sometimes, but here we go. It says, Christ is the head of the church, and so also the husband is superior to the wife in authority, not in dignity. Ephesians 5.23 Ordinarily, men, man excels in the qualities suited for rule of home such as physical strength, decision, courage, and hence as every society, no matter how small, must have a head, the husband is the natural head of the home. But obedience is due a husband in domestic matters in which he is head of the house. For example, the choice of the place of residence, the management of the family, uh, income, the discipline of the children, but not in the wife's personal affairs, that is, in her conscience. A, a, a superior has no right to the conscience of their subject. Now, I'm saying that because I, as a, as a superior, have no right to the con I cannot command my subjects, my friars, who they're, they're I call them subjects here because we're I'm using a wife as a subject to her husband, but she's she's a beloved spouse. The friars are my beloved brothers. Do you see? But still there has to be hierarchy, there has to be order. But I cannot command one of my friars to tell me what's on his mind. He doesn't have to obey. I can't tell him, I can't tell him, you tell me what you said in confession. Now you all know that's wrong, 
But he, he, he cannot obey that. Well, he could. He could obey it if he wanted to. I have no right to ask it. And he doesn't have any duty to respond. Same thing in a marriage. The conscience is yours. That's where God speaks to you directly. The husband has no right over the conscience of the wife. The wife has no right over the conscience of the husband. A superior has no right over the conscience of their subjects. Parents have no right over the conscience of their children. Do you see? The conscience is a very personal thing. Or her politics or her property. The property thing, I don't fully understand because we don't see a lot of that here. But I guess when you had noble families, they had their, you know, they, they had their lands, their ancestral lands and all that kind of stuff. Well, it wasn't really the husband's. He could probably advise her on the things, but he couldn't say, you sell those and give me the money. No, <laughs> you can't tell me that. That's a, these, these, are my, these are my lands. Those are your lands. Leave it, leave it as it is. So that's probably what it means, but I don't really have a good grip on all that kind of stuff. And it continues, and only in commands that do not exceed his authority. For he has no power to command if he is irrational meaning he's lost his mind or he's, he's intoxicated. For he has no power to command if he is irrational and he has no claim to obedience if he orders something sinful or foolish. That has to be remembered. You still have to, as a subject, any of us who are subject to authority have to be very careful when we're commanded. We don't just throw it in their face and just start, you can't tell me to do that because we don't want to do that kind of thing because you want to keep peace, but I don't have to do that because before God, I have to obey God before men. That comes from scripture, right? That St. Peter and St. John said that a couple different occasions in um, to the Pharisees, to the Sanhedrin during in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. But you remember, you're obedient. A wife is obedient to her husband because she's obedient to God. And so... If you're commanded to do something that's against God, you may not do it. You may not do it. You, you, I, I shouldn't say may. You better not do it. Okay? Moreover, since the wife is a partner and not a servant, it has to be remembered, the wife is a partner and not a servant, and since she usually excels, this is hard for some younger men because they really see that their wife is a lot better doing stuff than they are. So they get kind of jealous of her. No, no, you should be happy that God granted you a wife that can make up for all of your failings because you're incapable. That's a very, very beautiful thing, especially if she humbly does it. Moreover, since the wife is a partner, not a servant, and since she usually excels as sympathetic and uh, as a sympathetic and wise advisor, and, and careful household manager, and is naturally more virtuous, the man should consult her on important family questions and decide then, and decide them as far as possible by mutual consent, and should gladly leave to her sole control and direction the many things in which she is more competent than himself. Let's put this into perspective. We all know I'm putting this more in perspective for a family where there might be more of authoritarian problem, somebody that doesn't really know how to delegate, someone who wants to lord it over their wife. You got to think anybody that leads um, a government or they lead any fabric of society, you have any kind of king, they're always going to have advisors. They're going to have people that help. Well, in the household chores, your partner is the wife. So she's taking care of a certain section of your society. You're taking care of a certain section of the society. When, when something has to be decided, it just, not that there's an absolute duty. The wives can't go and say, Friar Anthony said, you have to check with me. That's not what's being said here because there isn't, there isn't a duty here. Well, what, what, what they're trying to say here is you'd be stupid not to ask the one who's, who's got boots down on the ground and dealing with the thing every day or who might be more capable on the subject than you are. Now, some, some of you are fortunate enough to have wives that are quite capable in certain things. And th though they might not have a degree or this or that or whatever, uh, have all the knowledge of as though they had that degree or whatever, for you to just come in and make a decision blind without any information is imprudent. Are you allowed to do it? Yeah, you're in charge. You're allowed to do it. Is it a prudent thing to do? Might not be too prudent. So what they're trying to say here is take counsel. 
And in that, in the keep that harmony of the family, that's a good thing to do is take counsel with the one who's the other half of that society, right? In the end, the husband has to make the decision. He has to make the decision because it's going to fall on him. Everyone knows an authority position, even if you don't want to make the decision, it's still your job to do. Somebody's accountable. And that's the problem with being the one who's in charge. You've got to be accountable. So the, the wife wants to help the husband because she doesn't want him to be accountable in a bad way before Christ. But then again, wives, if he doesn't come to you, that's just, a, a you know, before God, you can just offer it to God. It's a trial. It's a hardship, but it's not your responsibility. It's his. If he doesn't want counsel from you, you just, you just kind of mortify it. It's a difficult thing, but you mortify it and face the consequences because that's what happens in society. I mean, we see it with presidents. We, they get these presidents and stuff like that, but it's society. I bring it up because of society. God gave Christ himself for the church, Ephesians 5.25. And so also the husband has the duty of providing for his wife spiritually and temporally. Remember there's an order. It's not all about the husband going out making money and taking care of the wife. Spiritually first and temporally later. Making sure they have the ability to make their devotions. Uh, having the things in the house that are going to provide for the devotions. And the wife's going to be able to advise you on all these things. Uh, it's going to help them through their prayer life during the day with the family and, and whatnot. You, usually, usually, um, usually the husband should attend to the external affairs of the family, such as its support and protection, while the wife should take care of the internal affairs. This is a very wise and beautiful thing, because if women are to, can, if women are to, to be that, um, um, if if they're to if they're to be that uh, that kind of tender uh, support within the family, that delicate tender support in the family, which is is so very necessary to not bring the world into the family, then what that means is the husband's able to come home to something that's not worldly. He's able to come home to something that's not in crisis. He comes home to a family that that they're per, they're preserved from it. They're more recollected. They don't have the busyness of of the world, the world, the secular worldliness inside the house, if that makes sense. While the wife should take, should, should take care of the internal affairs, such as the housekeeping and training of the children, which is of course the most excellent duty, um, or the most important duty within that society, that, that society of the family. It is to be uh, regretted that the smallness of the husband's salary often compels the wife to work outside of her home, it says. Now it says for the women, women should not be compelled to take up occup occupations unsuited to their sex, much less than, um, much less those that interfere with the supreme duty of motherhood. Injury done the common personal goods of, of husband and wife by one uh, one of, by one of them is unjust if due to the illegal, if, if due to illegal actions, it is at least uncharitable if due to carelessness, the family goods are usually under the control of the head of the family. The wife has no right to use the earnings of her, of her husband without consent, unless he fails to provide suitably for his family or uses his money extravagantly. A couple of quick things here on obedience, because people don't really understand what it means. And here in, in America, especially with women because of um, feminism, obedience just sounds like a horrible word. It's not a horrible word, it's a beautiful word. It's a virtue. The definition of obedience is this. Obedience is a supernatural moral virtue which inclines us to submit our will to that of our lawful superiors in so far as they are the representatives of God in marriage that's the head of the family in in the for the children it's for the mother and the father right in religious life it's our superior or our parish priest or the bishop or the and the, it just keeps going to the pope 
foundation of that virtue, obedience rests upon God's sovereign domain and upon the absolute submission creatures owe him. Do you see that? It's not that we're being, we have to submit to some man and they're all this, whatever the feminists would say about it. We're submitting to God, but we don't see God all the time. So we submit through the superiors that he puts before us and we want to be, it's better to be in subjection than not. Because you have, a, you have less to be accountable for and you have more ability to merit for heaven. God's law for representatives. Man is not self-sufficient in his physical, intellectual, and moral well-being. Now remember, when we say man, we mean male and female. God willed that he live in society. Society, however, cannot endure without an authority which coordinates the efforts of its members towards the common good. Here, family is a society. Hence, it is God's will that in society there should be superiors commissioned to command and the subjects whose duty it is to obey. This is from Tanqueray, I believe. Who are lawful superiors? Those, those who are placed by God at the head of the different kinds of societies. So here we're talking about the husband, who is the head of the family society. Limits in the excess of authority. When can we find ourselves where we, can't, we just can't obey? Commands that directly oppose the divine law or ecclesiastical law. Divine law or ecclesiastical law. We have, to, uh, we have to obey God rather than men. And sometimes it means we're going to suffer greatly by not obeying, um, by not obeying the human authority that's been put for us. But we have to obey God. And we can't use that as a way of not obeying somebody because then you're going to be culpable before God is doing something very wrong. That could even be mortal sin. You are not held to obey authority when you're asked to do something that's impossible. You know, if I ask, the, I tell the friars that, I don't know, I don't, I can't come up with an example. But you're not, you can't, you, you're not, to, you have no duty to obey something that's not possible. So you don't have to freak out about and say, he's asking me to do stuff I'm not even able to do. Then don't worry about it. You don't have any responsibility to do it. He's going to think you're disobedient right uh, but you but god's gonna know you weren't disobedient because it's not possible to do the thing so you can't do it so don't worry about it but but i'm gonna have to suffer all these things yeah th that's what we do i mean that's just what you do in life you suffer a lot of things so it's all meritorious we suffer for our lord and he loves that and he did it for us and so we do it back to show him how much we love him now when there's doubts about whether you can do something, and this is something because remember, most of you listening are Anglo-Saxons, not all of you, but the Anglo-Saxons are nutcases when it comes to like obedience and rules and scrupulosity. Now I'm not making fun of anybody with scrupulosity. It's a, it's a difficult thing to get through, but I also don't want to give you a whole bunch more rules so you can start um, bathing in rules and things like that. But when there's doubt, if you have doubt, we have to remember we're prone to illusions. We're prone to illusions. We must act on, uh, so out of principle, if we have a doubt, what, we're, what our superior is telling us, whether it's your husband or it's your religious superior or, or whoever, whoever your superior is, if you have a doubt on what they're telling you, whether you can do that or not, you have to go with the superior. Do you see? Because if not, you'll always have doubts and you'll start using the doubts to undermine your superior. Unless you know. So when it's sinful, you either know it. If you have to say, I don't know if that's sinful. There you go. Then you need to obey. Okay? If you say, that's sinful, I can't do that. There you go. You can't do that. Does that make sense? This is something where it's clear cut. That's directly against the divine law. That's directly against ecclesiastical law. I'm not able to do that. That is impossible. Can't do it. I know it for sure. Not able to do it. If you say, I don't know if I can do that, then you better try. St. Saint, Saint Charles Azetse, his, his novice master, just told him to, um, 
there was a tree in the middle of the road. All of you come to the retreat. I, I always tell this story every year, but there was a, a tree in the middle of the road. And his novice master said, under the, under the virtue of obedience, I, tra Brother Charles, I want you to go move that tree. Well, he looked at the tree and just walked straight at it. He didn't, he didn't like say, I can't move the tree. Why are you asking me to do stuff I can't do? You're just setting me up for failure. He just walked straight at the tree. And then his superior said, okay, stop. I don't need to see a miracle. So he called him back and they just walked around the tree. There's another time the novice master, they had the cabbages and they were outside plant the cabbages. And one of the brothers was a, um, uh, one of the brothers was a farmer by trade. His whole family, they were farmers. Well, the novice master came out and scolded them, ridiculed them and said, well, you're planting them all wrong. And he told them to take the cabbages and plant them upside down. Well, the farmer kid knew that you can't plant cabbages that way, that they don't, they don't grow that way. Well, the, the superior knew it too, but he was just giving them commands, which he had every right to do. Is it sinful to plant a cabbage upside down? Is it impossible to plant a cabbage upside down? No, it's possible to plant a cabbage upside down. It might be impossible for it to grow, but that, it's not your job to make it grow. Your job, your superior told you, take the cabbage upside down and plant it in the ground. So he just, Charles Zetse took it and he just planted it in the ground and his grew. The brother that complained about it didn't do it and his didn't grow. He planned it properly, the way you're supposed to plant it, and it did not grow. He later left religious life, and St. Charles Azetze say he went on to have a bad life. So obedience isn't necessarily that, it, it, when it comes down to a doubt, you have to follow the principle, just do what your superiors told you to do. Whoever's in charge, do what they told you to do, because you don't know if it's right or wrong. You also don't know if it's possible, but you're going to merit by doing it. If you know, without doubt, or confusion, then you may not do that thing. Now let's look at the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then we'll call it quits. The Blessed Virgin, this also comes from um, St. Saint, Saint uh, Lawrence of Brindisi. Uh, he brings up the fact that that punishment that was given to Eve, that she, that um, thou shall be under thy husband's power, and he shall have dominion over thee. Since our Lord preserved her from the fall, uh, and she was thought of in one of the same decree as our dear Lord, she kind of in the mind of God predates the, the history of salvation when it comes to the fall and all that. So she's exempt from this whole thing. Our Lady's exempt from, um, from, from this punishment. So in the relationship with St. Joseph, St. Joseph was given to the Blessed Virgin Mary as her helper she was not the helpmate of saint joseph saint joseph was the helpmate of the blessed virgin and the holy family right but now for you ladies that might think it's difficult to do these things you have to look and say but do i want to imitate the blessed virgin mary the blessed virgin mary let me only let me back up you have a duty to follow this, to cooperate with God's plan. You shall be under your husband's power and he shall have dominion over thee. You signed up for marriage. You made the contract. This is what you have to do to cooperate with God's will now. Our lady was not under this uh, punishment, this command. She didn't have to live this. St. Joseph was given to her, the queen of heaven, as a helper. And she submitted herself as though this command applied to her. Do you see? Our dear blessed Lord committed himself to St. Joseph as though it applied to him as well. And this is where we have, to, we have to understand that there is no injustice on the part of God or in society or from the church or whatever else the feminist heart wants to say. And I say feminist heart not against women. Because it's been, it's been, it's tainted men and women, I think, equally now. It's just destroyed society. So when I say the feminist soul, I basically mean sons and daughters of our culture today. We have to look to our, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and we have to realize that she, who had no duty whatsoever to submit to these things, did. Our Lord, who had no duty to submit to these things uh, that applied to us, and not to him, he did. So when we look at it, we, we don't have that there, if we find ourselves contrary to it, if we find ourselves fighting against our husband,
fighting against our wife and everything else that goes on in the in the in the in the tension in the in the difficulties between uh, a man and a woman which there are differences but we have to remember they're complementary differences you don't w women shouldn't be men and men shouldn't be women oh, oh didn't mean <laughs> to say that but these are these are the things that uh, that, that that bring them together to make that that relationship complementary for the children you see and for the goodness of a man the, the the differences that are found in a woman when a man is able to um when he's able to work with a woman contrary to what you know his forceful nature and when the woman's able to work with a man contrary to maybe her more um i don't know kind of um gentle nature and they can work together in harmony there's a there's a chiseling off of all the gruff or rough edges of the man and of the woman so that that complementarity uh, starts to make perfection in in man that is male and female come together and be seen more beautifully and that's that conversation that they're talking about the, the saint paul and saint make let your let your good conversation be known that is our good the good example that we can give through having harmony live between a man and a woman in the beauty of a um of a marital and family society does that make sense so i think that ends the um the conference it was longer than i wanted it to be and i, I I'm, I'm sorry about that